Sure. All right. Um, it's, this is my great pleasure to host uh, Professor Dan Oran with us today. And I'm at this uh, beautiful campus uh, here uh, behind me at Beacon University. Uh, Professor Oran uh, received a Bachelor of Science uh, degree in Mathematics and Physics from the Hebrew University in 1994. Uh, he later earned his uh, Master of Science degree in Physics uh, from Ben Gurion University of the Negev, uh, and then uh, followed uh, with his PhD in Physics from uh, the Weizmann Institute of Science in 2005. And uh, after his uh, postdoctoral uh, research work with uh, Professor Uri Bani, who I know very well, uh, uh, being in my field in the uh, non-crystal world, uh, at the Hebrew University, he joined um, the Weizmann Institute. He is currently a professor at the Department of uh, Molecular Chemistry and Material Science at Weizmann. And his interests include uh, the interface uh, between light and the nanoscale. Uh, in particular, uh, he has been studying the interaction of light with nanostructured materials, um, a, a mostly inorganic uh, 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 and hybrid semiconductor crystals. Uh, he is uh, uh, also working on super resolution, um, and um, in this way, he has been looking into uh, quantum and classical fluctuations in light emission. And today, uh, he'll be uh, uh, giving a very interesting uh, lecture on his almost quite uh, personal uh, interest, uh, which I know. Uh, this is the optics of biological nanostructured materials. Without further ado, uh, uh, Dan, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Volkan. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be, uh, to be with you, even if uh, virtually. So uh, let me share my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes, indeed. Very okay, well. Very good. So, um, so I'll try to make this uh, sort of a, a light talk because we're approaching the weekend. And um, I'll tell you about uh, the, what I call the nano optics of life or optics of biological uh, photonic crystals mostly. And this is a topic that uh, I've been working on for the past uh, almost 10 years. I came across this by half accident and I'm completely amazed by the breadth of this uh, topic. Um, I'll try to assume not, um, not much about the background in, in optics. And so uh, without further ado, let, let me proceed. And if there are any questions, uh, please just write in the chat or barge in. This is supposed to be informal. So, so yeah, so let's, let's just get on with this. So a few words about my, my group, uh, although Volkan uh, presented it very well. Uh, we do a lot of things that all have to do with light and the nanoscale. Uh, one is, is uh, quantum dot uh, synthesis, semiconductor quantum dot synthesis and photophysics. This is where, where I, I got to know Volkan uh, very well. Uh, another is uh, applications for photovoltaics of, of these kinds of materials, mostly nanostructured materials. And then we have an effort on imaging and endoscopy. So either imaging through multi-core fiber bundles, uh, computer sort of computer vision uh, like topics, uh, lensless imaging, phase retrieval, more recently super resolution microscopy. But today I want to talk about something completely different, right? And that's the optics of, of life, of living systems. And Optics appears in living systems in many, many contexts. Um, this could be vision, it could be communication, both within the species and uh, between uh, animals of different species. There's camouflage, uh, of course, there's photosynthesis, and then there's many more. And these are examples of some of the systems that we have been looking at uh, in the past years. Uh, the zebrafish, uh, silvery spiders, uh, trees of various kinds like pecans and ficuses. Um, this is a, a, an animal I'll talk a bit more about later. It's called a copepod. 
And uh, this is an example for a visual system. I'm not sure if, if you knew that uh, scallops have eyes, but each of these dark dots that you see in this image of a scallop is an eye, and, and those eyes have uh, a particular, particularly peculiar structure, uh, which, which makes them very unique in the visual world, and uh, we've looked into that also. So maybe an, an, an underlying theme, which, which is sort of present whenever you start to study biological systems is, is this relation between structure and function. So you can, you can quite readily, there are today tools which, which make studying structures very sort of straightforward, not easy, but straightforward. And then evolution is this amazing engineer, right? Because animals have had uh, millions and millions of years to, to develop uh, smart uh, strategies to control many things, including light propagation. Function is not always clear. In, in all the examples I, I will show you, I think we are already quite, uh, we have a quite good grasp of the function. But generally, say, let's say reverse engineering is something you have to do. You, you can measure a structure, you can um, see the, the outcome of the, the structure that is present. Uh, it's not always easy to understand the function and, and definitely you have to do reverse engineering, especially considering the fact that a structure is something static, but life is not static. So often when you see a structure, it's sort of a, a picture, a frozen picture of an animal, which in fact evolves, changes, grows and, and whatnot. So if there are three conclusions that I would sort of be happy if you, you draw from this kind of talk here, uh, it's those. One, natural systems are amazing and they're worthwhile studying. And towards the end of this talk, I'll show you that it's not just that evolution is an excellent engineer in the sense that, you know, it has already developed many, many of the optical solutions that we are so familiar with, but actually it, it, natural systems already have uh, uh, developed ideas that, that we humans uh, have not thought about until now. So we, we really should, uh, should have some humility towards nature. The second is that combined structural and spectroscopic data can lead to a better understanding of function. And this is important because it's not just the structure but you're sort of seeing a spectroscopic data which tells you something about the function and, and that helps reverse engineering. And the third is that sometimes if we're lucky, we get better designs from a natural system for artificial materials that we just haven't thought about uh, before. And sometimes they outperform everything that we have, you know, we, we know in, in in human scientific literature. Okay, so let me start with an example. It's one of the earlier systems that we studied. Um, we came across this by complete accident. So um, let me just first run the movie. There's some psychedelic music. I don't know if you hear it. And uh, this small animal is about one millimeter in by half a millimeter. So it's a very small species. And uh, it's, it's basically plankton. It's at the bottom of the food chain. And let's just first have a look at, at this movie. So you see this uh, transparent animal. It's always there in the frame, but sometimes it just appears to be gone like now, and then at other instances, you see this really bright blue-green reflection or flash from it. And that, that looks like peculiar technology, right? So it's sort of impressive.
Okay, so what did we see? Um, this animal is called a copepod, and copepods are plankton, as I said, at the bottom of the food chain. And um, we happened to run into these uh, when uh, we were studying another species, and uh, some of the students uh, went to the Red Sea to a lot, you know, the south tip of Israel. And uh, they, they went uh, towing some, some uh, basically fishing for some animals. And in the water tank that, that they were towing, the, they found a few of these. And as you can see, they are amazing reflectors, right? They, they look, if you know how, you know how a dielectric mirror, on one of those that we use in the lab, uh, looks like uh, it's iridescent, right? You cha it changes the color as, as you change the orientation relative to it. And the fact that this, this animal flashes, appears to appear and disappear is because when it rotates, the reflection from it goes from the blue-green range into the ultraviolet. And then we don't see this anymore under a flashlight. And then we started looking into these and uh, in this process, we, we came across this, uh, this video that was filmed by a person uh, who has a diving school in Indonesia and put this online on YouTube, along with many other interesting videos of, of marine animals. And he kindly agreed that, that we use this video also in a, in a paper that we wrote about the optics of this creature. So we know this is reflection, right? And it's iridescent. So let's talk first before we go into how exactly this works uh, into, into a bit into reflections, right? So reflections are all around us, but they don't always origin from, originate from the same physical origin, right? We have uh, mirrors, metallic mirrors, like in these mirror mazes. And that's, that's one type of mirror, the most common type of mirror that we have, say, at home. Uh, there's grazing incidents. Uh, so, so light at grazing incidents is often reflected from the interface between two dielectric materials. There's a fata morgana, you know, that's the bending of rays due to a gradient in the refractive index. Uh, in this case of air. And there's uh, this sort of standard uh, dielectric reflection, this 4% uh, of light that is reflected from any, say, glass air interface. So when you're looking into the store and the day is bright, the store is dark, you see mostly the outside and not the inside. So what is this reflection? In, in the end, from a physical point of view, it just boils down to a refractive index. Right, so the refractive index is uh, something that tells you about the impedance or the speed of light in the me medium and the attenuation in the medium, and also relates to the polarization of light. So uh, this, this concept of impedance, of course, was developed first for sound waves, which don't have polarization. They're um, longitudinal waves, but light has polarization. So, so transverse waves, and then this depends also on that. And there are two types of, you know, of interfaces. One is an interface with metals or in more general uh, materials with free electrons. And the other is a dielectric where there are no free carriers. Uh, and of course, both of these reflect. And the person who set the ground for the understanding of this is uh, Jean-Augustin Fresnel, a, a French, uh, scientist and and you know this is old science it's about 250 years old or 200 years old way preceded maxwell's equations for example so later of course um james maxwell used used these findings and others uh and and you know this set the the foundation for electrom the electromagnetic theory of light so now we know of course that light is this electromagnetic wave uh, reflection from an impedance mismatched uh, interface is, of course, a general wave phenomenon. OK, so if we now take Fresnel's equations, which tell us how much light or what is the, the amplitude of reflection of light from an interface, 
we know that uh, light is usually partially reflected at any dielectric-dielectric interface. So if we have two dielectrics, say a high index dielectric and the low index dielectric, the high one being colored here in pink, the low uh, colored here in, in cyan, um, every, when light impinges upon this at every interface, we get a small reflection, which is typically a few percent uh, depending, of course, on the index mismatch, on the relative refractive index of, of these two materials. And now, because this is a wave, it has an amplitude, you need to consider interference. So all these scatterings are coherent if this is a, a wave with sufficient coherence length. It doesn't take much um, mathematics to realize that you can construct something which we call the ideal reflector. The ideal reflector for light of a wavelength lambda using two materials of index n high and n low is what we call a quarter wave stack. So the optical thickness of each of these layer has to be exactly lambda over four. Why is that? Because you have a reflection here and then you want the second reflection to constructively interfere with that. So you have to take this, this path that's, uh, you, you want that to be a, a exactly two pi phase shift. So you would say, okay, I need half a wavelength, but actually you need a quarter because there's some extra phase when you go from high index to low index and then no extra phase from low to high. So it turns out that if all these are quarter wave, you get perfect constructive interference of the back reflected wave and the forward going wave is attenuated more and more, actually exponentially with a number of layers. And a large index contrast is favorable because if you look at the expression for the reflectivity, there's a term here that deals with the number of layers in, in, in the exponent here. But then uh, there is also a term which, uh, which depends on the high to the low index um, ratio, which is the index contrast of the system. So, so you can compensate for a low index contrast with more layers uh, and vice versa. And now this idea can be generalized, of course, beyond one dimension to generate something which we call a photonic crystal. Um, first uh, thought of, you know, in the context of, of higher dimensions by Eli Oblonovich about 40 years ago. And a photonic crystal is any periodic arrangement of regions with high and low refractive indices. So basically a crystal, right? Because there's translational symmetry and the Bragg reflector or the, the quarter wave stack that we talked about before is, is what is called a one dimensional photonic crystal, but then you can generalize this to two dimensions and to three dimensions. And three dimensional photonic crystals have uh, under some conditions a peculiar property. That peculiar property is something called a full band gap. So a material, a hybrid material because it's, it's got spatially variant refractive index is said to have a full band gap if for a certain color, light cannot propagate in any direction. It's reflected no matter what is the direction of propagation. And it was shown that a full photonic band gap requires an index contrast of about two uh, with current designs. And that, that's not so easy to, to achieve. This is the, an image from the first 3D photonic crystal, which was based on a silica opal structure infiltrated with silicon. So, okay, and now let's go to biology and let's try to look at the simplest biological mirror that you might think of. So actually biological mirrors are all around us, but probably the one that you've seen the most is fish scales. So this is, you know, this is an image of a koi fish, but actually if you go to the fish market, um, most of the fish look sort of like this. This is used for camouflage. The top of the fish is, is, um, is, is sort of darkish so that if, if you look at the fish from above, it blends with a, with a, with a 
background, which is sort of dark. The bottom is, is sort of reflective so that you don't see a shadow as you look at the fish below. And this helps fish evade predators. But it's funny because all of us have seen fish many, many times. I personally haven't stopped for one moment to think what gives fish this funny color. Uh, or this this funny sort of metallic hue, and it was it wasn't until uh, you know a student came knocking at my door, helping uh, asking for help with some uh, with some uh, calculation transfer matrix calculations of fish scales that I became acquainted with this field. So how does uh, how do fish get their silvery color? In fact. This is exactly a dielectric mirror. On the scales, you have these special cells called iridophore cells inside the cell. This is a cryo-EM image of a broken scale. This is a zoom in and you see that there are these crevices. And in some of the crevices, you see a small crystal popping out here or here. And if you get rid of, of all this organic material, much of which is water, you find these, these nice sort of hexagonal shaped uh, crystals about 20, 10 to 20 microns across and a few microns in thickness. And as you can see, they're very well ordered. So they're all parallel to one another and they're all parallel to the direction of the scale. And this is really a dielectric reflector. So you might want to ask, what is this material? And what are the special properties of these materials? And in almost all the biological dielectric reflectors that you can find, the material of choice is anhydrous guanine. So guanine is the same guanine that you have in your DNA, right? It's a very, very simple molecule. And this, it's a very special molecule in the way it crystallizes. It crystallizes in this uh, manner, which resembles, you know, Van der Waals materials. It generates a very strong uh, hydrogen bonded network in the plane. But out of plane, there are very weak, uh, weak bonds uh, connecting the different planes. And this, with a sort of the partially aromatic structure in the plane, give it a very peculiar property. It has very strong biorefringence. So it, it's actually a, a biaxial material, but the two refractive index, indices in the plane are very close to one another, about 1.83, but the out of plane refractive index is 1.45. So this gives a hint about why guanine is used it has a very high refractive index. And in these reflectors, the low index material is basically cytoplasm or water. So refractive index of 1.33. So indeed, this is a very high index contrast as compared to other materials used in biological reflectors like chitin, cellulose, or even calcite. So you get a 1.83 refractive index, which is very nice. And the reason that this is the only important refractive index is that light comes from the outside and the polarization of light is parallel to these crystals in general. The other uh, important thing is cellular availability. So guanine is basically a waste product of DNA, which is recycled in the cell. So it's very easy to get guanine and all these other related materials that eventually um, our bodies get rid of as uric acid in urine. But you can, it's, it's a material with very high availability. So at the time when we looked at fish scales, so we tried to see if, if you know, if how these reflectors are constructed and fish scales are often cited as random reflectors or Anderson reflectors. It's as if the, the spacing between the different crystals is completely disordered. In this case, however, uh, a disordered reflector would be more reflective in the blue than in the red. However, fish, they look silvery. They don't look bluish, usually in the tint. And as it turns out, there's a lot of thought put into this construction. It's a very broad reflector. It has to be silvery. 
But it turns out that when you look inside a cell, there are nearest neighbor correlations in the spacings between crystals, and this flattens out the reflectivity spectrum. But generally, this is sort of a silvery mirror, uh, much like what, uh, what Phil Anderson came up with uh, in the context of condensed matter physics. However, there are other kinds of structures, like those of the copepods that I showed you, that are very well ordered. And this is a very nice example. This is a copepod called Sapphirina metallina. And you can actually, this is a cryo EM. You can actually measure very accurately the, the spacings and also the crystal thicknesses. The crystals are about 70 nanometers, which when you multiply that by the 1.8 uh, refractive index gives really nicely a quarter wave in the visible range. And then they're separated by cytoplasm. And if you take this particular copepod, you take an image of it, and then you take the cryo EM of the cryo EM image of the fractured uh, scale here, and you simulate the reflectance based on the distances here and measure the reflectance here, you get very, very nice correspondence between the two. So we really understand this is a perfect quarter wave stack with a simulated re uh, reflectance approaching unity and the measured reflectance of better than 80%. So this is a very nice dielectric mirror uh, constructed here. And mind you, this is plankton really at the bottom of the food chain. If you look, zoom in into the structure, it's, it's just mind boggling. Each of these uh, copepods has about 20 million of these perfectly hexagonal crystals on its, on its back, you know, it's one, one mil, less than one square millimeter, which are ordered, perfectly ordered and tiled. And they, they come in about 12 to 14 layers. So, so this is a really sort of 25 cavity dielectric mirror. So 12 repeats to 14 repeats of high and low index. And all this is perfectly arranged in a, in a chitin matrix that keeps everything in place. How they make these perfect hexagons is still a riddle. We, we don't have a good answer for this. But what they can do with it is sort of amazing. These are different copepods from one run in the Red Sea. And you see they come in many colors. This is the Coppelia mirabilis from the movie I showed you before. Uh, these are all Sepharina metallina, and they, you see that they have multiple colors. And you also see that, you know, they're good optical designers in the sense that this guy is blue, and this guy is also blue, but they're both very different blues. This guy is blue with sort of this tint of red, and the blue ref reflectance here is a second order reflectance. The, the, main reflectance peak is in the infrared. This is you know, red, yellow, blue, green. This is blue, but this is now the main reflectance peak. So it's, it's, it's the first reflectance peak, and this is reflected in the spacings. Spacings are very large here, very small here. And they're all guanine crystals, all fixed thickness, about 60, 70 nanometers. Uh, same species has very fixed, uh, very fixed thicknesses of the crystal. So why these colors? That's something that, that is harder to address, uh, but specifically about copepods, it's actually easy because only the males have color and not in these two species, but in some of the species that, that uh, of copepods which have color, uh, where the males have color, only the females have eyes. So the males don't even have eyes and that sort of tells you that uh, the color is used to communicate with females, right? So, so basically like peacocks. So in order to be attractive, uh, a copepod has to match its color to the light illuminating the sort of the vicinity where he is. But under the sea, you know, if you go really deep, you have to be blue. There's no other light than blue. But at sea surface, if you want to be seen well, there's a sort of, you have to be yellow green. 
but what about predators right because if if you're seen you know if a male is seen by females they it, it's also seen by predators and these these guys are at the bottom of the food chain so how actually do they do that and this uh, relates to a second riddle and the second riddle is you know i showed you a few colors quite a few colors of of these Safarina metallina um is this, you know, is this uh, color like the color of our hair that everybody has a different color or is this something dynamic? And the answer to that is it's dynamic. So this is a time-lapse movie of a Seferina Metalina, which was dark adapted. So this is in the dark. Remember in the dark, it's like being very deep. So when it's very deep, it, it's blue and this is under room light, takes five and a half hours. Actually, when we took them outside, it took a couple of minutes because sunlight is hundreds of times stronger than, um, than room light. So you see slowly how this whole thing turns from blue to this yellow, nice yellow green color. That's sort of the end. Uh, you don't see the tail because it's tilted, but the whole creature has this nice golden yellow color. So when they go up to the surface to feed, there's not much food at 100 meters below the surface, they change their color from blue to yellow green in order to be seen wherever they are. This is the other species that I showed you, um, the Coppelia mirabilis. So it's blue under, you know, in the dark when it's down at the bottom but it turns completely transparent when exposed to light. So it's, it's a very nice way of, of camouflaging itself because when it goes up to the surface to feed, it becomes completely transparent. And it does so by shifting the reflectance peak into the ultraviolet. So this is an amazing technology, right? Because we don't know how to do this. We don't know how to generate a mirror that changes the reflection color uh, by say going from green to blue or from blue to, to really deep in the UV uh, in, you know, in the period of, of, of a minute or two and then making this completely reversible. So this is what happens. Take a dark adapted and a bright adapted copepod you see that the cytoplasm layers, it's not the crystals, the crystals remain the same. The cytoplasm layer shrinks and you can really model this and, and, and get this, this nice behavior. And the likely mechanism is an osmotic pressure change, which is combined with a change in the microtubal network. So, so they really actively control this. Maybe I'll skip this. So this is, the mechanism here is something which is like an accordion. They have a structure that they know how to stretch and compress. There are other animals like this, uh, like this neon tetra fish that use another mechanism, which is what, what we call a Venetian blind. If, if they have layers of crystals that look like this, but now they apply strain on them, they tilt them a bit like this. And by tilting, the distance changes and they can change the color of this stripe of the neon tetra from blue to sort of nice green. And the way you see that is you can look at the X-ray diffraction under dark conditions. And this is the diffraction spot of guanine. Then you turn the lights on and it's, sorry, it was bright adapted. Now you turn the light off, it moves. And you see the spot moving as the structure adapts. And then it will, it's reversible. We'll turn the light on and the structure here. And this diffraction point will start moving back. So it's not as impressive as looking at the, the copepod changing its color, but it's, it's sort of evidence of the same thing. So how general is this whole uh, mirror structure, you know? Um, turns out that it, it's found, it's really ubiquitous. And this is one beautiful example. It's the dielectric mirror in the eye of the scallop. 
So these are scallops, you know, the, the eyes here are these small blue things, which of course, you know, you take off uh, if you like eating them. And this is the structure of the eye. Uh, there's a, a cornea, but no lens, right? So the cornea is a very, very weak lens and hence doesn't focus light on the retina. And instead, light which goes through the cornea hits this uh, structure here at the back of the eye, and that's a concave mirror. And this concave mirror directs light, focuses it on the retina, but now there's, there's a, a small twist. There are two retinas to this animal. This is the top retina, and this is the bottom retina. You see the nerve cells, they're um, dyed in, in this bright dye here. So how does the mirror structure look like? It's, it's not the smartest design for an eye because actually unfocused light passes through the retina, which means there's some reduced contrast, but this is a very primitive eye. And this is the, the mirror structure in the back here. And you can see it's composed of these beautiful square tiles. That's another wonder, which I'm not going to talk about. How can you take a material which tends to generate hexagons when it crystallizes and make uh, square tiles of it? There is twinning involved here in the crystals. Uh, but then again, you can look at the same trick. So this is this perfect uh, about 10, 12 layer mirror and you can, you know, you can uh, simulate the reflectivity here. Turns out it, it reflects mostly green light, which not surprising, blue-green light, which not surprisingly is what you have in the habitat of these scallops that live in shallow waters. Interestingly, you can, now that you can sort of get the complete structure of, of the mirror, you can try and solve this riddle of why, uh, why two retinas in this weird eye, why, it, why the particular structure. Turns out that the two retinas, at least according to what we believe, um, are used to look at the center of the field of view and at the periphery, right? So these mirror eyes have huge aberrations. Anybody who's used reflection optics knows that mirrors have huge spherical coma uh, aber spherical aberration and coma. But you can compensate for these aberrations by using a non-planar detector, right? So the retina is this non-planar detector that enables you to somehow compensate aberrations, especially at the periphery of the field of view. So the proximal retina, this one, which is really curved, is for the peripheral vision whereas the distal retina is sort of nice for central vision. This is another example. Uh, I'm sure you've seen uh, the eyes of, of fish, right? They're silvery. So their irises are very different than ours. The, the function of the iris is to reject light coming from, you know, not through the lens. But our irises are based on absorption, not on reflection. Fish irises are based on reflection, which is a funny thing, right? Why bother with constructing this really complex uh, reflector that's based on the first an ordered layer, then a scattering layer, and then a thin layer of pigment? And the answer to that, which, which took a bit to, to sort of find out, is that at the larval stage already, they, they need functional vision, right? Because you need to escape predators. But the eye is tiny. The eye is 200 microns uh, overall in diameter. And still, they need an iris. If you try to construct an absorptive iris for an eye that's 150 or 200 microns diameter as a sphere, it would just take too much of the volume of the eye. So for very thin layers, reflection is better than uh, absorption. Overall absorption always wins because there's an exponential decay of, of the intensity. But for very thin layers, if you're limited in volume to a very small eye, actually reflection works a lot better. 
And so the reflective iris works for, is developed first, and then the absorptive layer uh, comes underneath it. And now I'd like to tell you a final story about the superposition eyes of shrimps or prawns. So first, these are another kind of funny eyes that, um, that work based completely upon reflection. So no uh, refraction of lenses. But this has a nice twist because I'll tell you about a new kind of photonic crystal that we've discovered in, in these animals. So first, how does this eye work? So a superposition eye works like this. Uh, you have the pixels, if you want, these are the rhabdoms, the pixels of the detector. And then here on the outside, you have these blue stripes, which are mirrors. These are dielectric mirrors. And now light coming from infinity is reflected from this mirror over here and from this mirror over here. And so it generates an image, which, which is a large area image, right? But it's based completely on reflection. This is a top view on the reflector. This is the cornea. This is the reflector. This is the region where you have the rhabdoms. Now you see in, in both of these, these are micro CT, you see that there's some funny material which is constructing this reflector. But then there's another sort of this, what looks like the same material with the same contrast also in the retina in between the rhabdoms uh, that, that, uh, that are the light sensitive elements. So, we looked into this material and we're surprised to find that this is not guanine. It's another material. It's a sort of a close cousin of guanine called isoxanthopterin. It's also highly birefringent, also shares this layered structure. And again, is biaxial, but in plane has a refractive index, which is more or less 1.96, which is among the highest uh, that we've seen in organic materials, carbon-based organic materials. And out of plane, it has a refractive index of 1.4. This means that it has a birefringence of about 30%, which is huge. It's three times more than calcite. But now the most interesting part was not looking at the reflector. The reflector is sort of, yeah, same kinds of crystals protruding here. There's something interesting about the reflector in the sense that um, this is not a very good reflector. And so it's very efficient at grazing incidence. And this actually determines what is the acceptance cone of each of these photosensitive elements. But the more interesting part was identifying what happens at the retina. So how does the retina look? The retina has these rhabdoms. And these rhabdoms are big. They're tens of microns in size. There's a number of photosensitive cells in each of them. Uh, the ratios between different detectors, different uh, photosensitive cells on the same rhabdom tell you something also about polarization. So they can actually see polarization. And in between, sort of like a tray of eggs, there's this tapetum reflector. And the tapetum reflector has has two functions. First is if light was not absorbed in the first pass, it reflects it back and gives it a second chance to be absorbed, making the eye more sensitive. The second is if light is scattered by one of these rhabdoms, it, it doesn't get to the next rhabdom, right? It is backscattered. And this improves visual acuity because you're not mixing up neighboring random rhabdoms. But now if you zoom in on what happens here, this is the rhabdom, right? This is a top view. So you see the points where the, the rhabdoms are and you actually see the, the sort of small pockets where the light sensitive cells are. But if you zoom in, you see that the rhabdom is immersed in what looks like a bath of balls, small uh, spherical balls. And turns out these small spherical balls are also made of this material, isoxanthopterin. And if you zoom in, you see that they're really well ordered. They're very close to close packed. So this is really a photonic crystal. And now 
the story gets even, even more weird. If you look at individual spheres, you see that they're not, they're not, uh, they're partially crystalline or they're made of crystals. And it turns out that each of these is constructed more or less like a, a football, a soccer ball. So there are many crystals, uh, sort of like uh, the hexagons and pentagons in, in a soccer ball. And this means that the certain crystalline axes, the in-plane axes, they, they're always on the surface of the ball. The radial direction is always the low index one. And if you look at, at some of the broken spheres, you see that they're made like onions. So effectively, this particle is something we call a spherulite. A spherulite is a birefringent structure that has spherical symmetry. So the extraordinary axis is always radial. And the two ordinary axes are always tangential to the surface. So that's a very funny structure. So why do they do this? And well, you have to think about what can be the function of this tapetum. It has to backscatter light more efficiently. So does this kind of a scatterer backscatter light more efficiently? You can first calculate the scattering cross-section of a single sphere like this. Uh, it's a hollow sphere. If you compare the total cross-section, it doesn't scatter light more efficiently than just a plain sphere. But if you look at the backscattering cross-section, it's about twice more efficient in backscattering light than this kind of structure made from an amorphous material. And then you can try and calculate the, the band gaps or the, the photonic structure, the total photonic structure of a photonic crystal made from these birefringent structures. Turns out that effectively, when you make a photonic crystal from these birefringent structures, it's only the tangential, the refractive index that plays a role. So this is a much, much more reflective structure because the tangential refractive index is very high at the expense of the radial refractive index. Basically, you're concentrating the electron density on the tangential refractive index, but turns out this is the only one that plays a role. And so this kind of birefringent structure generates new gaps where light cannot propagate through the structure. And if you simulate this kind of structure, you see an almost full gap. OK, it's not full because the index contrast is not sufficiently high, but an almost full big gap encompassing all the blue region, which is the only relevant spectral region for these uh, shrimps, which are deep dwellers. OK, so that's sort of the story that I wanted to tell. Um, it was about biological optical systems. They exhibit very rich phenomena. They follow many design principles that were invented independently by us a bit later. And the materials are organic, right? So it's not the materials we are used to make um, optics with, and they can exhibit unique properties like huge birefringence and are recycl recyclable, de photodegradable, et cetera, et cetera. And self-assembly is this really potent tool for making extremely accurate photonic devices as good as the best photonic devices that we are making. And then studying those systems with, with some humility holds a lot of promise towards not just better understanding of evolutionary principles, but also towards engineering applications. So now my group is focusing a lot about this whole concept of integrated birefringent optics, which we learned from shrimps and hasn't really been used in, in this world of photonic crystals. So with that, I'd like just to thank the people who are involved in this work, a really long line of students, uh, starting from uh, Vital, uh, Osip, uh, and Tvir, both of them are now uh, assistant professors here at Weizmann, uh, Ben Leshem, Ben Palmer, now an assistant professor in Ben Gurion University, uh, Jaya Suri Ayala Pragada, still a postdoc in my group, and a really long collaboration with Leah Dadi and Steve Weiner, two giants of, of you know, biomineralization, uh, with whom I had the pleasure to work on this. 
and also Vlad Brumfeld and, and Gil Avkovich, uh, Gil for the zebrafish and Vlad for the micro CT help. Uh, financial support, you for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Dan, for this very interesting lecture. It's very inspiring indeed. And I have a number of questions, but let me check first uh, with the audience here. Um, so the uh, platform is open for questions, please. Any questions? Uh, feel free to jump in. I'm checking if there's any virtual hand uh, raised up, but I don't see any. Uh, any question there, please feel free to jump in. Okay, I could, I think I see your hand. Yeah, yes, was, please. Uh, that was a great talk. Uh, I have a couple of very naive questions. Uh, so one of them is, well, you know, let's say we want, we want to build a device using this organic crystals. And, you know, you want these devices to have long shelf, you know, shelf, shelf lives, 10 years, 15 years. So how, what is the stability of these uh, organic crystals, you know, in, 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 in under you know, ambient conditions. And my second question is, so when I saw this hexagonal crystals, you know, you, I guess you kind of isolated them after you got rid of the uh, biological tissue. Have you tried to, you know, use these crystals? I know, I know they are very difficult to isolate. So probably you have very, you know, small amount of them, but have you tried to like maybe put them inside an hydrogel then, you know, maybe deform the gel and try to control this inter, uh, you know, plate distances? So two great questions in the sense that these are things we are working on now. The first is uh, regarding the stability of the crystals. Actually, these materials are extremely insoluble in water. We don't understand completely how uh, they're formed inside a biological medium. The only way that we have been able to synthesize um, these materials in vitro and in the right polymorph, there's a number of polymorphs. Uh, the biological one is not the one that you usually get in vitro, is by using extremely high pH or extremely low pH, because these are not very soluble materials. Um, when I say very high, I mean, you know, 13 or two, something like that, which is not something you'd get in a biological environment. What we do know about biological growth, it is done in, in these membrane delimited compartments. Uh, so, so definitely there's some interesting chemistry going on, which we don't understand. Uh, but the materials are extremely stable uh, because, because they're not soluble. In, in, you know, they're only really soluble in DMSO, so. That's, that means it there, yeah, there's that. Right. Um, the, the second question relates to uh, using um, biologically extracted crystals and trying to, so, so our pathway to this is trying to mimic growth. This is again, not easy uh, because the, it's not just the quantities that are very small when you extract from a biological medium. Often you damage a bit the crystal and often you get uh, extra organic material that you can't get rid of. And this sort of distorts what, uh, what we think we can get from these structures. But this is definitely the kind of direction we're pushing forward now. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'm checking if there are any other questions, please feel free to raise your hand, if any. In the meal, mile, maybe I can ask my question then. Yeah. So this was very interesting indeed to hear about uh, all these uh, living organisms, uh, even deep in the sea. Um, but, and you explained why some of them has very specific distinct colors. Now, my question for you is why green? Uh, meaning that uh, the largest biomass is green, green plants all around. And I've been thinking about this for a while. Why is it green? Given well, why... this solar radiation, uh, given uh, uh, the, uh, the light of spectrum that makes to the uh, earth, why should we have the plants to be green and no other color? 
So about about plants, this is uh, this is a different question because yes, you know, true plants in general absorb almost everything. It's just that they have a small fraction of the green that they don't absorb, but uh, yes. they absorb almost all the green also. Um, Maybe I sh I should say uh, uh, chlorophyll. So the uh, 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 the type A and type B. Uh, absorbing yeah. only in blue and in green, uh, slightly shifted respect to each other, but none in the green region. Well, so, so, so leaves are 200 microns thick. Right, uh, right. And, uh, and, and they absorb most of the green also. Whatever is not absorbed, it's just some of it is backscattered, mm. which is why mm -hmm. it's the green. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I have a good answer for this, although you know, we have we have worked uh, also about the, the, the biology of or the optics of leaves. Um, what, what I can say is that higher plants, uh, they, they don't need all this light. You know, mm. their photosynthetic apparatus is completely saturated at about 10, 20 percent of peak, uh, peak solar irradiance. So, you know, noontime definitely in, in Israel, also in Turkey, uh, most of the photosynthetic machinery of higher plants is completely saturated. They're actually working really hard not to damage the chlorophyll. Yes. So yes. it's not about maximal absorption. It's not a yes. photovoltaic cell. Yes. In fact, what plants need, and that's something we have looked into, is a, a, a mechanism that will be able will make them able to generate energy no matter what the regime of illumination is. So both at dusk and at dawn, in the shade and in the sun. And it turns out that there are optical mechanisms in leaves that, uh, that make, say, part of the leaf uh, efficient at low intensity, while other parts of the leaf are efficient at high intensity. So, so it's a bit wasteful, but... Uh, but you get always a positive contribution. So, so it makes sense. But that's yeah. a different story I'd be happy to tell you about. Yeah, I, I would love to hear else. more. But I, I, I'm happy to hear that uh, what I was thinking is at least in the right direction. Uh, because my thinking was uh, that um, it, it is indeed uh, to make sure uh, you don't get damaged. Uh, so yeah. there's a lot of work, as you are aware, I'm sure, uh, on artificial photosynthesis. And the biggest challenge is to make sure it works under high uh, fluence, uh, which is always hard to do so. So the plants have managed, managed to survive exactly. under uh, at the expense, extreme. At the expense yes. of efficiency. They yes. do this but, at but, the expense of efficiency, but they know how to self-repair. Yes, that, that, that is true. Uh, and then uh, just to expand this uh, scientific discussion, maybe uh, surprisingly, uh, although this is perfectly true and I do understand, uh, when you look at um, uh, starting uh, uh, from uh, the seed all the way the plant growing and how much uh, you need to put into in terms of materials, energy and everything compared to all other types of human made uh, solar uh, harvesting systems, plants uh, has the shortest break-even point in terms of what you put into, uh, and this includes everything, materials, energy, whatnot, uh, as opposed to, for example, solar cells. Uh, that, that, although that is, they're, they're not efficient, uh, they still have the shortest break-even point. That is true. They just don't have to pay for the real estate. Yes, I guess so. Wonderful. Thank you very much. This was a wonderful, quite inspiring and interesting lecture. Uh, please uh, join me to give your virtual applause for Professor Oran. And uh, thank you so much, Dan. This is wonderful to have you here today with us. And we will be sharing uh, this recorded lecture uh, with the world. Thank you. Take good care. Thank you very bye much. Bye. Welcome. And uh, thank you all for this invitation. Our it's pleasure. Been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take good care. Goodbye.